this video, we're going to be building one heck of a bathroom vanity. 10 feet long, to be exact. And that isn't necessarily the cool part. We're also going to build a hair accessory drawer insert not for my hair, and a rather cool finishing technique that looks like a gray stain, but I'll let you in on a secret. It, it's not, it's not a gray stain. Fortress has a new employee. Dude. Yes, the rumors are true. Fortress has a new team member, and just in time too, because my back is nearly breaking carrying all of this lumber around myself. Cody and I are getting the maple and plywood we are using from Austin Hardwoods of Denver. Thank the wood gods that two of us can handle those three quarter sheets now. But the wood gods were not so nice to my cheap table because the leg literally fell off as soon as Cody touched it. Those cheap import tables. Poor Cody is already dealing with the grief of breaking something in the first five minutes of being in the shop. We do eventually get it all put away though. Here's a quick overview of the vanity as a whole. It's made up of seven lower cabinets that have an abundant amount of storage, with a lower toe kick that wraps around the right side, and I'll let you know why this is important later, and an upper tower that sits on the stone countertop with some classy crown molding to dress the whole thing up a bit. Just like most cabinets I build, I start with the boxes so I have a skeleton to work with. And now I have to remember that it's not just me, it's we. And of course, I'm already having problems. For some reason, this plywood is binding up and I've never really had this problem much before. We decide to push on and see if the problem continues, which it does. So my thinking is that the plywood has some tension in it and just like hardwood, when I'm cutting, it's pinching the riving knife and making it hard to push. And before you assume it's my fence alignment, it's definitely not. My fence is and always has been dead nuts. And here's Cody doing a beautiful first cut. His past expertise is paying off already. One thing that I'm beginning to notice is that there's a whole new realm of skills that I acquired so long ago that I forgot that they were even skills. And now that I'm teaching every motion, every tool, every nuance and safety measure, I'm realizing that there's a lot that I haven't taught you as the viewer. So I think it makes sense to teach you about some of those hidden skills while we continue this build, because I think it's important that the nuance of woodworking can be different for everyone. So before I had Cody do any of these dado cuts, we had an entire day of safety training. But more importantly, I told him how these dado cuts can really bust your balls. Oh, I mean literally. I confidently told him that running dados like this, I have accidentally gotten kickback right in my nads three times before. Let's just say I don't have children. So hold on tight and never let go of the panel. Talk about nuance. We are using pocket holes as well as dados for extremely strong cabinets. The dados provide a strong mechanical joint as well as a surface to glue since this is pre-finished plywood. And this is where another hidden skill is evident. Learning how to tap that drill trigger so you don't strip out the screws. Cody's a little heavy handed now, but I'll tell you, he learns quick and there they are. Now we can begin getting the maple ready for face frames and doors. And without Cody there in the early mornings and late afternoons, I can do it all by myself. This weird cutting style actually has a purpose. By chopping at the end of the cut, then coming forward and finishing the cut, it helps reduce the chances of binding when the boards haven't been jointed yet. Just try it and you'll see what I'm talking about. Just keep your hand away. So Cody says that the toilet paper here is like sandpaper. So I'm gonna show him what sandpaper is really like. And now we wait. When I'm using the joiner or any machine for that matter, I'm always paying close attention to where I'm applying pressure. It's amazing how much feedback our fingertips can give us when we tune in. Sometimes you can even feel if you're getting tear out because the heavy vibrations will resonate through the board. 
I'm sure at first it's hard to notice this stuff, but utilize your hearing and touch senses to give you input on your cuts. When you begin to understand the certain sounds machines make when they are cutting well versus when they are cutting too aggressively, you can also feel these sounds in your hands on specific machines, even through push pads. And remember that sandpaper prank? That was hilarious. How was the 80 grit? My ass is bleeding. Okay, maybe it wasn't that funny, but here's a lesson learned from the experience. Jokes are all in good fun. Life isn't that serious, or at least shouldn't be. Another thing that I notice as I share my processes with Cody is that it's okay that he does it differently. Yes, at first his cuts are a little too fast and he may be pushing that domino machine a touch too hard, but it's all about feel and getting to know the motions. And if I'm being perfectly honest, he looks like he has years of experience and I think it's because he's being a good listener. He's taking my input and directly putting it into practice without question. These face frames can be temporarily mounted with no glue, just screws and presto. These next steps are really where I started noticing how helpful it is to have someone else around. Especially for a vanity of this size and 15 drawers to finish, just simply having someone to install all of the tedious hardware for these undermount drawer slides is a true game changer. I was able to mill all of the maple for the drawer boxes while he took care of the hardware, so now we can get everything dimensioned for the drawer slides. But it's time for the weekend, so we're leaving everything to acclimate. It's good old Monday morning, and instead of getting started on the drawer boxes, I think it's smart if I run some tests on the coloring process so that come finishing day, I'll be ready to rock and roll. My finishing supplier had the great idea of diluting three test samples at different strengths to see which sample would perform the way I need it to with this particular wood. And I'm sure you have no clue what I'm even talking about, so let me explain. We are going to essentially paint everything gray, but not with thick primer first to fill the grain and get a nice smooth finish. Instead, we're gonna use the paint as an opaque stain, and we want to be left with physical and visual grain that we can utilize for another coloring step. So I'm diluting samples 10, 20, and 30% to see which one will let the maple grain transfer through, since maple is a very smooth grained wood as it is. I'm forced to use an HVLP gun, so I'll do my best at getting a reliable coat that will be consistent with what an airless sprayer will produce. Don't forget to mark the sample board so we don't lose track of which is which. We will come back to this process once the paint is dry. Meanwhile, Cody is here, so let's get started on the drawer boxes. We use box joints instead of dovetails because it's different, and any method will work just fine. Box joints can be a little fiddly though, so if your fit is too tight, a great trick is to throw it back on the jig and cut the last three grooves one more time. You'd think this wouldn't work, but it actually does, at least with my setup. Here, I'm teaching Cody how to assemble the boxes the easiest way possible. And once again, I never realized that there's certain skills that a person can develop when assembling. I'm trying to explain that bracing one end against his body will help free both hands to get the joint closed up. So he decides to give it to me so I can show him specifically. And I guess I just brace one end, then wiggle the joint tightly with firm pressure to overcome the tight friction of the box joint. Then a few pin nails from the end lock it into place. These joints are admittedly a little on the tight side, so he has me finish the other side. It's time for him to drop his tools and skedaddle anyways, so we will pick up on this tomorrow. The next morning, we are on fire. He's applying glue like a madman and assembling the joints like a pro. A 
A quick outside sanding is done while I make the grooves for the undermount slides. And the rear holes can be drilled. You'd think by now that I would actually have the jigs that Blum sells. And there they are, one of the tedious tasks in cabinetry. Now the paint is dry on our test samples, so we can test the next step. I'm giving it a quick sanding here, but I will say, on the final sample, I didn't need to. The next coloring process is glazing. But in this case, you can actually think of it as a stain. I'm mixing different ratios of white and black to create different charcoal values. The glaze can be sprayed or wiped on, then wiped right back off. I'm checking the sample door that the customers provided to see if the color's there yet. The darkest test is with solid black glaze, and it's the closest. So I decided to spray one more sample and I'm not sanding it before glaze. The glaze is pure black with 5% propylene glycol to increase the working time since it's water-based. And the clients are very happy with this, so we can move forward. Remember the toe kick I mentioned earlier? Having it wrap around the side versus a continuous side gives us the ability to level the cabinet with shims, then hide the shims all of the way around with quarter inch toe kick paneling. We disregarded that design change when we were fabricating the boxes because I knew it would be easy for me to make the customization later. And of course, later is now, and so it's easy enough to remount the recessed toe kick. The doors and drawer faces are next, and I think this will be a fun process to teach in person. A final milling is done just before we start the fabrication process. That way, everything is nice and straight for accuracy. His cutting is much smoother now, and I'm sure he's getting a real feel for proper speeds and pressure. I'm learning a lot on the router table lately, and it really is easier to route the tenons in the rails first, before the grooves. That way we avoid this problem. Safety is more important now than ever. And speaking of safety, I didn't even realize this next thing until now as I'm reviewing the footage. It's a bad habit to get in having your fingers under your push pad like this. You can't see the blade cutting, therefore you can't see if your fingers are about to get cut off. Maybe I did catch it though, because here he is with a corrected form. One last pass with a V-groove bit cleans up the ragged inside edges. The drawer faces get half inch floating panels, but they need to be rabbited in order to fit into the grooves cut into the frames. Don't forget to pre-sand the panels and the inside edges. But why? Why not just sand them later? If you sand the panel after, inevitably you won't be able to sand every spot. Then the glaze will highlight those areas. And if you sand the edges after, you'll create cross grain scratches on the panel. And again, the glaze will enhance those. While the doors are clamped up, I want to get the special drawer done for the customer's hair accessories. But I'm finding out that I don't think there's going to be enough room. So I make a call to the client and propose an idea. And thankfully, they think it's a great idea. We are going to cut the bottom off of one drawer, then joint it on the jointer, as well as the top of the other drawer. Then the two can be dominoed together to create one extremely deep drawer. That actually went way smoother than I was anticipating. 
That tall drawer can't fit back in the cabinet though, at least with the current face frame. So that's fine, I'll just cut out the affected rail and that solves that problem. The drawer box can be sanded inside and out and reinstalled. Now the insert can actually be made for the drawer. It has stainless steel sleeves that keep the hot curling and flat irons from burning the cabinet. So after I figure out the placement, I guess I can burn through the panel with my hole saws, then find the spot for the blow dryer, and I guess burn through that with my jigsaw. Sheesh. And lastly, a spot for the flush mount outlet needs to be cut. Some of the holes have to be refined on the spindle sander, then the box can be assembled. Meanwhile, Cody is sanding his little heart away, trying to get the million components ready for finish. The inserts are ready to be attached. I just use a little silicone around the rim, then set it in. I will also leave links to all of these in the description. The outlet can also be set. I made sure to leave space for the cord to pass through without touching potentially hot metal sleeves. Then the cord can be fed through a back hole in the drawer box. Then the insert can gently be slid into place, of course. The bottom panel of the insert makes sure it doesn't slide around in the drawer, while also providing a place for the cords. With the insert back out, I decide to drill a few venting holes in the drawer towards the wall side. No one will ever see these. Oh my gosh. Now the heat has somewhere to go. The doors still need a few processes to be complete. Did someone say montage? Montage, montage, mon 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 montage, 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 montage. I of course made two of the drawer faces as tall as the doors that will be next to them. This leaves a 3 16th gap between the drawer faces. So to mount them, I clamp a board to the bottom of the cabinet, then an eighth inch spacer for the first reveal. The reason I do an eighth inch reveal on bottom is if there's any heavy weight in any of the drawers, the drawer won't sag below the bottom of the frame. And by the way, the screws are drilled angled so they screw into the styles then the first one can go on and be pinned from the back. Four screws lock it on for good. Now the 3 16 shim can be placed and the next face can be attached to that same tall drawer box. On this leftmost cabinet, I left a 3 quarter reveal on the left on the wall side so that the drawer doesn't hit the door trim in the bathroom, and an 8 inch reveal on the right towards the next cabinet and the doors can be installed with the same eighth inch bottom shim. With both cabinets together, there is a quarter inch space between the door and the drawers. This offers just enough room to avoid interference when the door opens, and a standard 16th gap between the two opposing doors. The doors are all kinked in because the bumpers won't go on until after finish. For this next step, I make sure the doors are perfectly flush in height. Then I can check to see if the upper false panel is in line with the two door edges. And in my case, I have to trim the width of the doors down just a skosh, then re-sand and round over the one edge. I just adjust the doors in using the hinges, and now everything is a perfect fit. The reason that specific panel has to be false rather than a true drawer is, these two cabinets are sink base cabinets, and the sink sits in the way of what potentially could be a drawer. There is a way to make it possible to have a drawer here though. If you use what's called a vessel sink that sits on top of the counter, you can make a drawer that has a cutaway allowing for clearance for the drain. Although these types of sinks seem to come and go in and out of style. 
The upper tower can receive its doors, as well as fitting the side panels that will be colored to the final gray tone. It would be easy enough to just mount the crown molding directly to the cabinet and call it good, but this small detail can really set your work apart from others. Adding a standoff to the cabinet first will allow the crown to sit above and in front of the doors, but the crown won't be installed until after finish. I also cut a little false panel trim piece that will fill the three quarter gap on the left cabinet. The sink base cabinets get one shelf each and those shelves need to have a section cut out for the drain and P-trap to pass through. Some edge banding finishes them off and now we are ready to disassemble and finish sand everything. We made this little tool to help screw in the hooks, and boy oh boy is this nice to have. Everything that can be hung is hung. There are a lot of components in this project. The final dilution ratio that performed the best on maple is 30% water in Envirothane 200 top coat. This color is Sherwin-Williams 7018 Dovetail, and it's being sprayed out of a Graco airless sprayer with a 308 FFLP tip. I'd like to take a grateful moment to thank some of my special people. My patrons on Patreon support the extra work that goes into these videos, and the first 20 patrons get a handcrafted gift as a symbol of my gratitude. Consider checking out the different tiers, and if Patreon isn't for you, then consider liking and subscribing because it also contributes to the growth of this channel. And most importantly, thank you for your support. You can see in this clip that the water-based top coat really raises and exposes the grain. We are going to utilize this. So after mixing a batch of Zenith 4750 light black glaze and 5% propylene glycol, as I said before, I can give Cody an opportunity to get acquainted with the sprayer since the glaze gets wiped off anyways. It's always helpful to start with an easy piece. Don't just jump right into the doors. It allows time for you to get the amount adjusted and the wiping time and technique down. We are basically trying to get the glaze to stain the raised grain that we created with the water-based color coat. Making each piece consistent with the last can be hard, but trust me, the more you pay attention to this, the better the final product will be. If you screw one up, you can immediately spray it with glaze and re-wipe it for another try. We found that having him spray and do an initial wipe was best, then I would finish with a final wipe down and sometimes with a damp rag. Here's what it looks like before and after. I know it changes the color a lot, huh? And that's why it's rather hard to match a sample because it requires a sense of experience and guesswork in picking the right colors and depths of glaze. And I didn't mention all of these steps have to be done in the same day. Otherwise, this clear top coat that I'm spraying won't adhere to the cured color coat underneath if we wait until the next day. Now it's the next day and you could stop here, but we can still feel some of the raised grain, so the best option is to give everything an extremely careful scuff sand with super fine pads, then vacuum them off for one last clear top coat. The drawers also get two coats of the clear, but no color. Cody did an absolute wonderful job. Now the face frames can be siliconed on with their pocket hole screws as clamps. Any holes in the bottoms of the doors can be filled with gray wax. Blum hardware and 3 16 bumpers can be installed. And we can also use these plastic clips to mount the faux drawer faces on the sink cabinets. These just allow these panels to be removable for install. Just make sure they are dead flush with the doors. This is when Cody decides he's going to blow the water out of the air compressor, but apparently no one told him it's going to be rusty. 
I literally did not expect that. Back to the important stuff. The end cabinet with the special toe kick gets a finished panel, as well as the upper tower. The crown standoff can be attached with silicone and brad nails. Then the crown can be carefully cut and positioned into place. Take your time here. People notice perfect crown joints. They just do. You can touch them up with a bit of wax if you need. On install day, starting with a level line is helpful. Then the cabinets can be positioned one by one with shims to reach the proper height. Some need cutouts for outlets, some need holes for plumbing. Before screwing anything to the wall, get all of the cabinets connected with three screws each. I like to use wax so I don't break any screws. Now we can make sure all of the cabinets are dead straight, then screw them to the wall studs. We fast forward a few weeks in time and now the cabinets have a countertop. I know you're probably laughing at me here. I still mark the holes by hand and drill them out without a jig, but I've done it like this for literally eight years, so I can't help myself. The corner trim piece can also be glued on. The granite guys are actually the ones that lifted the tower cabinet into place because they had to install the backsplash on either side. Lastly, the toe kick can be glued on. The right side is just mitered and there is a joint on the front since this is 10 feet long. I always try my best to be the one to caulk the toe kick, that way water doesn't ruin it over time. And we are finally finished. Some of the bathroom isn't finished though, but I had to get final shots when I could. And if you live in the Colorado area, check out Colorado Tile Company. Morris is a wonderful contractor and I'll leave a link to his website in the description below. So without further ado, it's time for final shots. You didn't say your line. Oh, yeah, I forgot. In my head. <laughs> so wait, this, what am I supposed to say? Dude? You can subscribe by clicking on the left icon, and here's another awesome video to watch.